we are not your usual science center. Once a secret laboratory, Camp Evans is now a fun educational place to visit. Our 12 museums will give you and your family or group an amazing look into the beginnings of the technology that everyone uses today. You can visit six of our 16 major buildings on our 37-acre National Historic Landmark. We have a distinct mission and history that sets us apart. Camp Evans opened the science age, saw the development of radar, and is a black history site. These are just a few of the museums here at Camp Evans. We are the Military Technology Museum of New Jersey. We're a nonprofit 501c3 that works primarily through volunteers and donations. And uh, we're here to try and educate the public with regards to uh, how military technology filters into our daily lives that we're not even aware of. And the reverse also is how civilian uh, technology then goes back to the military. It's very symbiotic. The main goal of our museum, I think, is to really show the public or um, people that come to visit the museum that uh, there are uh, technologies that come out of a problem. For instance, here's a problem. How do we get up a hill? How do we do this? What's the solution to that problem? And with that, we have a lot of one-off prototype vehicles that really started the, the four-wheel drive market in the civilian public and all. This is one place you can come to that you'll see the three prototype Jeeps from the 1941 time period that really started the, the off-road uh, market in, in, or across the world, actually. But beyond that, there's smaller things, uh, little fun stuff that is uh, spread out throughout the museum, which we call Did You Knows. And for instance, Did You Know that uh, M&Ms, for instance, came from World War II soldiers' rations. They had a problem that they would put chocolate in the rations and it would melt. So the Mars company got a contract to figure out how to keep chocolate from melting when you were out in the field. And of course, it had the hard candy outside shell on it. And after World War II, then they marketed it to the public. So M&Ms are something that you know about and you use every day that came directly out of a problem that was created in war, that had presented itself in wartime. So there's, there's many, many things like how clothing is produced and why do, why do women's uh, blouses close one way and men's close another way. So it's just not all the mechanical, hardcore munitions and ammunition and mechanical stuff. There's a lot of uh, things that touch upon daily living that uh, I think everybody would enjoy. When I was younger, I remember movies like uh, PT-109 about JFK on a PT boat, and that got me interested in how the military operated during World War II, and also because the, much of the, the people that are around when I was younger, everyone, absolutely everyone, had served during World War II, and now they were at the age that they were raising families, and you would hear stories. So I, I just wanted to know more. I felt that this is... Uh, something that was culturally significant that you didn't hear about in the schools. And that's part of the reason that we have the museum here is to try and bring to life history that it really isn't being touched on that was a significant part uh, of uh, the culture of America now that created uh, who we are and all the people that fought. So if it's not really being taught in the schools to great depth or understood, uh, you can come here and you can see it and smell it and touch it, and it makes it more real, the stuff that's in the history books. Practically every piece of equipment in, in the museum has a personal attachment or story to it, whether people that drove it or designed it or whatever. But if I had to narrow it down to, to just one, we do have an amphibious Jeep, World War II Jeep, that has a, a bathtub and a propeller on it. It's not much bigger than a Jeep, and a man named Ben Carlin uh, in the 1950s took the amphibious Jeep, that type of amphibious Jeep, and he left New, New York City and became the only man to circumnavigate the globe in a vehicle that went in the ocean and also on land. Nine years later and three wives later, he came back to New York City. So uh, there are 
books that he wrote on it that are very interesting, and I find that attachment of human beings to the mechanical piece of equipment is, is really what makes the museum come alive. This museum is done by a bunch of volunteers, just anybody like you meet on the street, that are passionate about trying to preserve history and teach and educate uh, people and children. And uh, we do it on a shoestring. We do it through a lot of uh, volunteer labor. And we really, really, truly depend on uh, you know, donations from local businesses or people to operate. We even put in our own money to go to do this. And, and we feel if we're bringing something the quality of uh, things that you're not going to even see in the Smithsonian to a local area like this, that, that it's um, something that we think the public will really enjoy. The New Jersey Historical Divers Association got its start back in 1992 when a group of divers got together to identify a wreck off of Manasquan, New Jersey, called the Manasquan Wreck. But it was also called the Rickle Wreck, the Hardware Wreck, because any of the artifacts that you brought up off of it, you could find in a hardware store. When we did a comparative analysis of all these artifacts that came up, we were able to find out that they all had about a three-year period of time when they were all in common, when they were all available on the market. And that was around 1820 to 1824. And right at the end of that period was the wreck of the Amity off Manasquan carrying a boatload of those artifacts. So we were able to identify the Manasquan wreck as the Amity of 1824. And since then, we decided to apply this technique of research to about 14 other shipwreck sites around New Jersey, off our coast. And we've been successful in identifying about 14, 15 wrecks to date. NJHDA, New Jersey Historical Divers Association, is self-funded. We hold an annual symposium where we bring people in that are interested in hearing about the work that we've done and the work that others have done or other maritime or marine related topics like shark research or jellyfish studies. We've even had someone come in and give a, a long talk about horseshoe crabs and why they come up at certain times of year and what they do, what it is horseshoe crabs do. But mostly what we talk about is shipwrecks, shipwreck diving, and shipwreck research and history. That's our big event, our big annual event. We also have membership drives. We have uh, charity functions like uh, cocktail fundraisers. Uh, we'll also do, uh, maybe a, we'll have a, a, an author come in and talk about a new book he or she has written, something related to New Jersey shipwreck history, and we'll charge admission for that. We're also given gifts by people that want to see us be successful. And uh, we'll, from time to time, apply for grants, usually matching grants from the county or the state. My favorite artifact in this exhibit is the millstone that we have back in the corner of the room we're sitting in. It's just a simple round piece of stone. It looks like a big scaled up coin, like a big penny. But what I think is fascinating about that artifacts is it, that artifact is that it actually has tool marks, chisel marks, from where the stone cutter actually fashioned the stone. You're looking at the very thumbprint of the manufacturer back in the 1850s. And I think that's fascinating. That stone, I mean, it's stone. What could really affect it, right? You're looking at it pretty much the way it looked 150 years ago, maybe even more than that. The mission of the New Jersey Historical Divers Association is to preserve New Jersey maritime and shipwreck history. And we do that through a variety of means. One, we identify shipwrecks and we share that with the public, our findings. We also are able to publish what we find, our findings, and we archive them throughout the region. We have our journal, our annual publication, which discusses our research results, available from Maine to Virginia. I think the thing that we want people to come away with when they visit the New Jersey Shipwreck Museum here at InfoH is what it must have been like. What was it like to actually be on a ship when it was wrecking? Is the person next to you gonna live or are they gonna die? Are they gonna be the one that saves you or are you gonna save them? Shipwrecks can be 
terrible incidences, terrible experiences to have to live through, but people do live through them. And it's the story that they tell that is the true drama that makes history come alive. I volunteered here after I retired from Fort Monmouth, and we found this room. I was originally with the EW people, and I still am, uh, which is up the hall. And I had this collection of uh, items at home, and I wanted to put them out where people could see them, and so that's how it started. Main goal is to depict World War II, tell people about what happened, show them the equipment. Uh, that's why we, we mix the artifacts with, with the items. Uh, I talked to them about the battles and how it progressed and what actually happened during the war. And it, the, the audience is everybody, and from little kids to older folks. The values of history, historical knowledge of what happened, because everything is predicated on what happened, in particular what happened in World War II. Everything that we are, we are involved in up until this point probably had its start during that war. We have three more rooms we're populating with artifacts and dioramas. In particular, we have a, a wedding dress that was made out of a parachute from a bomber, somebody in a B-17. And he got his wife, they married, she married him in, the, in that wedding dress and her granddaughter also used the wedding dress, married a, Viet, a Vietnam vet. As part of the uh, artifacts we have in here, we have three, four original posters from World War II, one uh, about Pearl Harbor and the other two about different uh, entities or battles in the war. And, but the one of the most interesting ones that people really uh, gravitate to is the Sullivan brothers. There were five brothers who joined the Navy together and petitioned the Navy to be on the same ship. And the Navy didn't want to do it, but eventually they wore them down and they ended up on a Janu, which was a, a cruiser. And they were in the Pacific and it was torpedoed and sunk, and all, all the five Sullivan brothers perished. Um, and the original post is kind of interesting because we have pictures. They must have taken a bunch of pictures in the shipyard before they left. And if you look at the picture, you see one of the individuals whose eyes are closed. Um, and then you look at another picture and his eyes are open, so they just picked the wrong picture to put on the poster. So it's an interesting artifact. A particular interest to a lot of folk is our diorama of the Battle of the Bulge. It depicts the Bastogne, the Ardennes where the Germans came from, and General McAuliffe telling them nuts when they asked them to surrender. It is in the middle of winter, around Christmas time, um, and everything's in snow, and the battle has stopped while the uh, negotiations went on. And eventually, after the Germans realized they weren't going to surrender, the weather cleared and the, and the airplanes were able to get back in the sky and Patton came up with his armor to relieve Bastogne. The reason I did this was because I had, my originally I had all this World War II stuff I wanted to showcase and show people. And this was the per perfect venue to do that. Uh, now, now, now that it's progressed to where it is, it's amazing. And with the help of a lot of people and um, the artifacts that I get, I also volunteer up at the uh, New Jersey National Guard Museum in Seagirt, and I get artifacts and I bring them down here to showcase here, that, that stuff that we're not using up there. And as, as the guy who built the diorama said, this, they have one big man cave. <laughs> and when you think about it, he's probably right. But this people love this stuff. They come in, they enjoy it. I tell the story of what happened on each individual um, dioramas and things of that sort. And it's uh, satisfying to see people learn this, even children. Um, and some of the children spar with me, which is good because they see this stuff on TV. And they say, that's not a, an M1, whatever, tank or something. And I let them go on, which is, it's fun. So, so that's the reason I'm doing it. Okay, the EW display started a number of years ago um, in conjunction with uh, a specific organization, the AOC Garden State Chapter. AOC stands for Association of Old Crows, which has a big, funny name, but a, a great history. 
and historically started in World War II um, on bombers that were outfitted with intercept equipment to, uh, that ultimately used to jam uh, German and Japanese enemy communications, radars, and navigational aids. This was very, very important to reduce the number of casualties of the bombing forces at the time. After the war, what happened was the Strategic Air Command uh, pilots decided to form a professional organization, and they established it, and this is a wonderful thing, at McGuire Air Force Base here in New Jersey, the AOC. It is now a worldwide uh, organization with 167 chapters around the world, and engineers and technical people are there. So that's how it started. I'm a member of that organization, I have been while I worked at Fort Monmouth and Camp Evans as a civilian engineer and uh, decided that because of the classification, there were a lot of stories that needed to be told that people didn't know about it. Since things were downgraded, we could now tell the story there. And in order to preserve that history of what went on here at Camp Evans and ultimately at Fort Monmouth, we decided to open this display. When we talk about EW, which stands for Electronic Warfare, it's now a significant part of the defense budget. But in the years past, it was funding went in waves, up and down. And uh, depending on uh, what the political situation was uh, and how the United States felt. And the reason we did this is because one of the uh, purposes of AOC is to inform and educate the public about EW in electronic warfare. Most of the people who come in here, if you say, do you know what EW is? They say, no, but I could spell it. And that's about it. And uh, a lot of people have never heard of AOC. Uh, I remember there was an article in the New York Times about in this country there are 2,200 associations, some of them very esoteric, such as the AOC, which stands for Association of Old Crows. So we wanted to get that message out because uh, throughout history, um, since the beginning of the AOC in 1960s, uh, a lot of lives have been saved because of the equipment that have been developed under the Defense Department budget. Since things have been declassified, again, we can now inform the public about these important, sophisticated developments that have taken place, explain them to the public in terms that they can understand, and maybe excite some of the kids so that they would be interested in getting technical careers. My favorite piece is right behind me here. It looks like a beautiful disco ball, but what it is is the ALQ-144 Infrared Jammer. When the public and the kids come in here, we explain to people that infrared energy, which is heat, is nothing but uh, nothing more than electromagnetic radiation. Okay. Now, electromagnetic radiation, we tell everybody, uh, is is the same, but the wavelengths and the frequencies differ. So, communications, radars, navigational aids, heat, it's all electromagnetic radiation. And the work that was done here at Camp Evans and at Fort Monmouth uh, was all related to uh, various aspects of that. This particular piece is very, very important because on a chart behind it is a very, very specific threat to low-flying aircraft called shoulder-fired heat-seeking missiles. Uh, the United States pioneered it with the... Uh, the Stinger missile, which was very effective, but the Soviets stepped up and have developed a family of threats, beginning with the SA-7, which occurs throughout the world today and is a specific threat uh, even today. So we explain to people what the threat is. We have a video of current events that take place in Syria where SA-7 shoulder-fired heat-seeking missiles are used and demonstrated. And then we explain in a non-technical and an unclassified manner how this particular uh, piece of equipment, the infrared jammer, works. And what's really wonderful that it was developed by engineers in this building where we stand, just down the hall at the start of it. And it ended up, and variations of it, ended up on all Army, Navy, and Air Force helicopters. And we're very, very proud of it because it ultimately ended up on Marine One, which is the uh, 
presidential helicopter for 40 years, and we have a picture of President Obama early in his career as President of the United States uh, coming out of Marine One, and on the bottom of the picture, you can see the ALQ-144. A number of years ago, electronic warfare was expanded to include, as part of it, um, and there's a debate about this within the community, defense community, to include cyber technology. The Defense Department recognized that the specific threat uh, of cyber a long time ago and started to include it in the area of electronic warfare, which was responsible for uh, electromagnetic spectrum operations, okay, control of the spectrum from a military perspective and to deny the enemy control of the spectrum and to protect our own systems from the enemy attacking us electronically. Uh, we like to say in, in the business that in EW, we don't use bombs and bullets. We use electrons and photons. And now if you read the paper today, uh, much of industry in this country and worldwide has been affected by cyber attacks. Okay, our enemies, and we know who they are without mentioning them, have uh, people and organizations dedicated just to doing that. And uh, a lot of industry has suffered from that. Our military systems are greatly protected because in the area of electronic warfare, uh, Defense Department recognized that potential threat a while back and has been protecting uh, our systems since then. We're going to have a tremendous expansion of the EW display, uh, and we're going to call it the Intelligence and Electronic Warfare uh, Pavilion in another building uh, and have almost 6,000 square feet uh, of space to work with. We will be able to include a lot of things in there and, and really explain to the public through these autonomous kiosks the various aspects of electronic warfare and intelligence, not just in World War II where we started and not just today, but throughout uh, the history of, of the technology, including Korea and Vietnam. And, and we're gonna be very proud when that uh, in place in another year and a half. CBOT started 12 years ago inside the hotel in one of the largest rooms we have with five dump trucks full of sand and an old pirate ship. And the first year they had 300 people come through. It built, it grew, it went throughout the hotel until finally the town said it's too many people. So they had us move the entire thing outside and now we have a three quarter of a mile walk and we have 6,000 people show up every year to be terrorized. CBOT is an acronym for Camp Evans Base of Terror. This used to be Camp Evans, which was part of Fort Monmouth, which was the radio corps for the Army. Base of Terror is, this used to be a base. Now it's a terror in October. The main purpose of CBOT, it's our biggest fundraiser of the year, and we raise money so we can continue to preserve and restore the site. It's a National Historic Landmark. It's not like going to a normal museum where you walk into a fancy building. When you come here, you walk into history. And we want to keep that history going for future generations. And the other part is we do have bills to pay. And to keep the electric on and the gas going, we need to have fundraisers. And this is just our major fundraiser. We start in July and right up to the first week in October, we're still building. It takes over a thousand man hours to do. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of fun. The process of gathering the plans and all that, we start in January. A lot of people start in October. As we're doing, doing the base of terror, they start planning for next year. So the planning takes a while, the building takes three to four months. The volunteers that come out, they pick a section they want to do. They come up with an idea of a plan. What kind of what they want to do is they want to do a haunted ride, do they want to do uh, a little town that's full of mummies, whichever. The, uh, the group sits down together, picks it out, and if they like it, we go for it. Most of the times the ideas are approved because they are so wonderful, and we work as a team and we get it done. Well, if somebody's interested in joining CBOT, all they have to do is come to a meeting, walk in and say hello, give InfoAge a call, send them an email. We'd be more than happy to have them with us.
we're always looking for volunteers, builders, actors, decorators. Um, if you'd like to volunteer, visit our website, www.infoh.org. There's phone numbers there. You can send us an email. We would be glad to have anyone that would like to volunteer in any, any capacity. Definitely scary for little kids. I wouldn't suggest anybody under 12 or 13. We've had people pee in their pants every year, which makes us quite happy. That means we did a good job. What most people don't understand is what goes on behind the scenes. And that starts in January with our planning. And then by March, I have to submit plans to the fire marshal and the township. And they have to meet with us. They have to approve all our building materials. They have to approve our electrical work. They come out, they start coming out when we build. They inspect every month. Then it goes to two weeks, then it goes to one week. And while we're open, they come out every weekend, every night, and they walk through before we're allowed to open. We have to deal with the police department who um, they have their own concerns because it is a large crowd, but we have to, when making our route, we have to be concerned about the route because they, there's areas they worry about, but I can understand it, but we have to deal with them. We have to have EMTs on site. We have to have fire department on site. We have to have, we have to follow all rules and regulations. We have to have a certain amount of fire exits. Nothing can be over six foot high because then it's considered a structure, more dangerous, and we'd have to go for township permit. So all of our walls have to be six foot or under. Um, and then down from there, we work with vendors and dealing with the vendors and the people that want to come in and do things. And sometimes you have to say no because the things just don't fit in. There's a lot of paperwork, a whole lot of paperwork. It's very, very long process. Even at the meetings, you have to sometimes say no. Most oftentimes we say yes, but you have to know where to draw the line. We have to deal with the companies we try to get items from and donations from to run it. Um, and for the most part, it's a whole lot of paperwork. And it, it is a year long thing for some of us that work in the executive office. We are nonstop with it and we wouldn't have it any other way. We like it, so we do it. There are many other museums here at Camp Evans. Just to name a few, there's the Marconi Hotel and Lounge, the World War I exhibit, the Fallout Shelter located in the basement of the Marconi Hotel, Historical Electronics and World War II Radar, the New Jersey Antique Radio Club, the Radio and Television Museum, the Model Railroad exhibit, the Veteran Wireless Operators Association, the Computer Deconstruction Lab, the Computer Museum by the Vintage Computer Federation, and many more. This is just a fraction of the things you will see here at InfoAge located at Camp Evans. So plan your visit today. Open Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 1 to 5 p.m. General admission is $5 per person. Group tours are available. InfoAge at Camp Evans. 2201 Marconi Road, Wall Township, New Jersey, 732-280-3000. Visit our website at infoage.org.